Welcome to Stagecoach, where you'll find the best Western books on the market and the men and women who write them. This podcast is brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, home of the best-selling authors in the Western genre. This is your host, Ginger Winters. Join us as we let Stagecoach take us on a ride back in time to the Old West with Jubal Stone, U.S. Marshal, Blood Trail to Hell, by Casey Nash, read by Justin King. Jubal Stone, U.S. Marshal, Blood Trail to Hell by Casey Nash, read by Justin King. Prologue. The frontier was no place to hang your hat if you were a coward or weakling. And sometimes even the strong and brave fell victim to the violence that stalked the land and plagued this new and untamed country. Such was the case with Sheriff Joe Stone and his family. Joe was a man's man with his narrow-brimmed hat down to his tarnished iron spurs. He had a hickory spine and anvils for fists. A lawman for over 25 years, Joe Stone split his time as a Texas Ranger and Sheriff, keeping law and order in frontier towns all over the Texas Territory. Before retiring, he finished out his role as Sheriff in the town of Abilene. He was firm, but fair. Wherever Joe served, he was well-respected by the citizenry, highly admired by fellow frontier lawmen, and unquestionably feared by lawbreakers. Yet, because of the incessant pleadings from his wife, Millie, and his own desire to live a more tranquil life, Stone recently checked his badge, hung up his shooting iron, and took up raising cows and a few head of horses. He and his wife bought a small ranch six miles south of town. Together, with their daughter and son, they were committed to make a go of it, and had started well. With two and a half decades behind the star, Joe, like other lawmen with his tenure, was responsible for sending his share of men to prison, thus he had plenty of enemies. Some of them vowed vengeance upon Joe, and few had already unsuccessfully tried and paid for it with their lives. Unfortunately, the last who tried achieved their mission. Four killers showed up at his ranch one day, bank robbers recently released from prison, Men Stone had put behind bars. They ambushed Joe and his family, shooting them down like dogs. However, the assassins made a grave mistake that fateful day. They failed to confirm that 14-year-old Jubal, shot and left for dead, was indeed dead. Now, eight years later, Marshal Jubal Stone wears a badge of his own. A 44 Colt sits low on his hip in a dark brown, well-worn leather holster latched down to his leg. Both gun and holster, his paws. Now behind a United States Marshal's badge, Jubal Stone will show no mercy when he crosses paths with killers, highbinders, and outlaws foolish enough to challenge his authority. He's curry combing the frontier in search of his family's killers. But in the meantime, he will mete out justice along the way. Chapter 1. Orphan's Jubal Hello in the house yelled the smiling, square-jawed gunman sitting atop the stringy, long-necked roan. He rolled the chambers of his pistol down his sleeve and stared pretentiously at the closed doors with an irksome smile. His lips dripped with sarcasm. I got some business to settle with you, Sheriff Stone. He looked over his shoulder. He wasn't alone. Three angry-eyed gunmen flanked him with their shooting irons drawn. Each one of them was committed to his mission. Kill the frontier lawmen responsible for their 20 years of hard labor in prison. A vigilante killing, the kind that was becoming all too common across the frontier. From inside the house, Joe immediately recognized the voice and frowned with concern. Then he quickly looked to his wife and pointed to the floor. Millie, you and Mary take cover and stay put. Crouching, he eased over to the window and drew back the curtain with a finger. Peering out, Stone saw the welcoming committee. Four men he and a posse tracked down and arrested for murdering a bank clerk and taking $6,000. Upon their sentencing, they vowed to kill Sheriff Joe Stone. Looks like they were making good on their promise. Stone had never been a man to turn the other cheek, and he wasn't starting today. He also knew if he didn't come out with guns blazing, his family stood no chance of surviving. 
Joe was all business as he strapped on his gun belt hanging on the peg near the door and yanked his pistol from the scabbard. I love you, Millie and Mary, were his last words as he stepped out on the porch, fan-firing his pistol. Joe, screamed Millie in the hail of gunfire. She grabbed Mary and pulled her close. With eyes tightly closed and chin atop Mary's head, she feared the worst. Jewel was in the corn crib gathering up nubbins to feed the hogs when he heard the men ride up and summon his paw. He peered up and down through the knot holes in the wide, heart pine boards, but he didn't recognize any of the visitors. Then he saw the door fling open and heard his father yell, I've got something for you, Tobias Fletcher, as he came out shooting. The muzzle of Joe's pistol flared five times. Each time the 44 Colt barked, Jubal's body flinched and his eyes blinked. A hail of returned gunfire followed. Joe knocked Fletcher out of his saddle just before the other three gunmen riddled his body with eight holes, but his death didn't sate their bloodlust. Jubal gasped in horror. His eyes darted back and forth as he searched the crib desperately for a weapon. There he saw the long-handled pitchfork leaning against the wall. He grabbed it up and ran for the house to punish his paw's killers and defend the rest of his family from the cutthroats. Unfortunately, he was too late. Millie rushed out onto the porch and fell over Joe's bloody, lifeless body. As Millie sobbed, Mary, Jubal's younger sister, was right behind her. Then six more gunshots rang out, followed by a loud, eerie laughter from the gunmen as they shoved their guns back into their holsters. Millie and Mary lay dead. Jubal quickly covered the ground between the crib and house at a full run. Then he hurled the hay fork into the air. It found its target in the lower back of a rider closest to him. As the wounded man yelled out, a bullet creased Jubal's temple and spun him around into the ground, unconscious. The shooter pushed his colt back into leather. Dang, where'd he come from? I don't know, Lane, but you sure done him in, answered one of his partners in crime. The wounded man leaned forward over his saddle horn in much pain, holding his lower back. One of the riders helped Fletcher to his horse while another grabbed up the reins of the fellow that got forked in the back and led him away. Jubal lay on the ground unconscious until the next morning, when a nearby neighbor came by with a crate of chickens. He was there to barter for one of the stones' as hams. He covered the dead and carefully loaded Jubal in his wagon and freighted him to town. Just hours previously, Jubal Stone had a father, a mother, and a sister, and a dream of expanding their ranch. Now, his family and his dream were dead, and Jubal was orphaned. Chapter 2 Wolves and Sheepskins Times were hard and lean across Texas, so taking in an extra mouth to feed was not an option for most. To boot, Jubal had lost the ability to speak. The doctors in Abilene didn't know if it was the result of the bullet that creased his temple or the trauma of what he saw. Perhaps it was both, but whatever the reason, Jubal Stone had not spoken a word since that day. Parson Zechariah Whitaker and his wife Sarah took Jubal in for the next few months. Stone enjoyed Mrs. Whitaker's cooking, but didn't cotton to the parson's expectations of him, which included memorizing a scripture a day, going to church twice a week, and chopping some wood for some widows of Abilene, six of them to be exact. Then one day, Parson Whitaker received a letter. It was from Hollis Johnson, who lived in Nacogdoches, Texas. Apparently, he had just heard that Joe and his family had been killed and invited Jubal to come live with him and his family. He also had questions for the parson about Joe's estate, which Whitaker could not answer. Jubal smiled with excitement at the news of his uncle's invitation. Even though he knew very little about him, he was appreciative to the parson and his wife for taking him in and he would miss them, but he looked forward to the prospects of living with kin. Soon, however, Stone would realize the hard way that sometimes wolves do indeed wear sheepskins. For the first couple of weeks at the Johnsons, Jubal felt welcomed. His uncle told him to call him Pa and Bulla, his wife, Ma. Even if Jubal had been able to speak, he wouldn't have granted their request, given his parents have only been dead two months. Jubal's half-cousins were very hospitable towards him as well. Elmer and Jip made him feel more like a long-lost brother than a half-cousin, insisting he stay in the same room with them. 
Yet, the Johnson's hospitality quickly turned cold when an Abilene judge denied Hollis's request to put Joe and Millie's ranch in his name. Jubal went from a welcomed guest to being treated like an unwanted intruder, especially by the menfolk. His workload on the Johnson's farm doubled. Now, expected to be up before daylight each day, he hitched up the mules and headed to the fields, returning at dusk. He didn't understand until later why things changed so abruptly, but given he didn't have anywhere else to live, he stayed and did what he was told. Each day around noon, Hollis would bring him a fresh set of mules out to the field along with a couple of cold biscuits. And if Jubal was lucky, a piece or two of bacon, all leftovers from breakfast. As Jubal switched out the mules, Hollis poked and pricked the boy with barbed criticism. He was never satisfied with his work. Leaning against the big cotton wood, Hollis took another gulp of spirits and lit into Jubal as he overlooked the flat land he'd just put into rows. Slick? That's the cruel name Hollis had given him for the scar in his temple. And rows are crooked as a dog's hind leg. Appears they've been laid out by the town drunk. That was an interesting observation from a man who was intoxicated himself. He slung the jug of homemade corn liquor to his shoulder and cocked his head to the side, taking three long gulps, most of which ran down his chin and onto his shirt. Wiping his mouth, he barked, Get back to work, boy. The crooked rows were mainly due to Jubal dodging dirt clogs and pine knots that his two good-for-nothing half-cousins threw at him from behind trees as he walked behind the mules. However, he wasn't about to defend himself, especially to a man who loathed him. Jubal glanced Hollis's way, hungry and wondering if his dog-mean uncle had brought him any vittles in the flower sack he was toting. In anger, Hollis squinted at Jubal and pointed, What are you looking at? It was high noon, and Jubal hadn't eaten anything for over six hours. Jubal pointed to the sack, then back to himself, as if to ask if it was for him. His question riled Hollis, who slowly looked down at the sack in his hand and smiled, but not because he was happy. An evil thought had crossed his liquor-laden mind, and he was just mean enough to follow through. Johnson crumpled up the bag and then pitched it at Jubal's feet. Yep, slick. It's for you. (laughs) What's left of it? Jubal stared down at the sack, angry but determined to hold his tongue. Hollis chuckled and staggered over and mounted one of the replacement mules he had brought. Then he reached for the reins of the other. Jubal looked his way and stared. I told you, boy, to get back at it. I won't abide laziness. That was funny coming from a man who epitomized slothfulness. Jubal removed his hat as an act of submission, then pointed toward the chestnut mules. Hollis went into a rage. You want me to take a plow line to you, boy? Jubal shook his head and pointed again at the mules, then threw a thumb over his shoulder to the pair, standing three-legged with their heads hanging low, the ones that had plowed earlier. Hollis glanced over towards the lathered-up mules and finally realized what he'd done. He slid down off the tail sorrel and fell to the ground flat on his back, spilling his corn mash all over his overalls. Jubal looked away out of respect. He was tempted to laugh, but knew it would result in pain. His pain, from a single tree or plow line, his uncle's favorite choices for punishing stone. Hollis struggled to get up. His generous consumption of corn liquid disabled him. He kicked and flailed his legs and arms, but still couldn't get to his knees. Waving Jubal over, he raised his hand and held onto his jug. Give me a tug. Damn mule jumped out from under me. Jubal did as he was told. After a lot of pulling, he finally got Johnson to his feet, then over to the brown mule where he hoisted himself atop the harness. He rolled up the plow lines and handed them to his uncle and did the same with the second one. As Hollis rode off, Jubal glimpsed Elmer and Jip, standing behind a tree. Then and there, Jubal Stone made up his mind that he'd soon be leaving the Johnson homestead. At 16, he figured he was old enough to make it on his own. Two weeks later, as he brought the mules in from the field, Elmer and Jip were waiting for him in the hayloft. He saw pieces of hay falling through the cracks of the floor above him as he led the mules to their stalls. Jubal had learned to stay on guard when the Johnson boys were near. They had caused him much angst during his day on the homestead. He had finally had enough. 
When Jubal first came to live with the Johnsons, he was a small-framed, lanky boy, humble and willing to do all that he was asked to do. Now, however, thanks to his uncle's determination to make his life miserable and force him to do most of the hard labor on the farm, Jubal had developed into a man, thick in the shoulders and arms, muscular and strong. He now stood 5 foot 11 and weighed 175 pounds. According to the cotton scales in town, he was considerably taller and bigger than his cousins, even though they were older than him. As he pulled off the mule's harnesses and hung them up, he noticed Elmer and Jip dropping down the ladder. Elmer had something tucked under his arm. Jip chuckled. Reckon that's you in that picture. He pointed toward Elmer, who grinned widely. Jubal lifted the bridles to the big spike on the post and stared curiously as to ask, What picture? Elmer pulled out the small wood frame with the photo from under his arm, a picture of Jubal and his family taken in Fort Worth, the only picture he had of his family. This here one, found it in your poke. Jubal had a place in the back of the barn where he slept after his cousins made it unbearable for him to stay in their room. He kept his belongings tucked away in a small wooden box in the corner. Apparently, those miscreants had found it. Jubal gritted his teeth and wagged his head. His face wrinkled as he held out his hand. Jip slapped his knee. Well, now, Elmer, I think we finally got Slick's go. Watch him now, he's as dangerous as a rattlesnake. Jubal moved towards Elmer with his hand extended. His face was red as hot coals and his hands balled into fists down by his sides. You want it? Go get it. Elmer tossed it to Jip, who was about 10 feet away. Is that you in the picture? Jip held it up and pointed. An uglier kid weren't ever born. <laughs> Just look at that run, Elmer. Elmer joined his brother, laughing wildly. Jubal turned and walked towards the barn door. I told you he was yeller, said Elmer to Jip. Yep, six a coward. All right, look at him turn tail and run. Elmer and Jip had no idea what was about to befall them as Jubal pulled closed the big double wooden doors and laid the long thick board across the steel purlins, something he'd seen Hollis do ahead of a storm. Today, there was another storm about to hit the Johnson homestead. Jubal Stone. When Jubal turned toward the brothers, it was as if he became another person. Jip made the first mistake when he strutted over like a peacock and knocked Stone's hat to the ground. Now what do you think you're gonna do, Slick? Jubal's right fist found Jip's face, immediately knocking him to the ground. Elmer dropped the picture and crouched. Oh, I've been waiting for this. He took a wild swing, but Stone ducked and weaved, then threw a flurry of punches, each hitting their mark, Elmer's face and body. Jip recovered and rushed Jubal, driving him into the wall. However, Jubal quickly spun him around and picked him up off the ground by the shirt. Then he flung him across the hallway of the barn and into Elmer, knocking them both to the ground. Both brothers got back to their feet and looked up and down one another. Blood leaked from their noses, but Jubal wasn't finished with them. He stepped in their direction. Jip lunged towards the ladder, hoping to climb to safety. Nevertheless, Jubal jerked him off the third rung and threw his body in the air like a sack of seed. He landed at the feet of Elmer, whose eyes looked as big as saucers. These brothers knew now they had woken a sleeping giant. Elmer threw up a hand of surrender. All right, Jubal, we've had enough. Jubal stepped over to the picture, laying in the hay. When he reached to pick it up, Jim came at him with a single tree. That proved to be a bad mistake, one that would earn Jip his own scar for life. Stone saw Jip's shadow on the wall and spun on heels, blocking the blow of the single tree. He yanked it away from him and in the blink of an eye swung it towards his opponent, striking him on the chin. Jip staggered over to Elmer with more blood leaking down his shirt. Elmer pushed him to the ground and ran for the door. Jubal, however, was on him like a cat. He tackled him to the ground, straddling his chest with raised fist. He warned him to never again touch his belongings. Elmer swore that he wouldn't. Jubal stood up and walked back to where his picture lay. Then there was a noise at the door. Hollis pulled back and forth in the handles but couldn't get it open. What in Sam Hill is going on there? Open this door! Elmer was happy to oblige his father. 
He struggled to lift the heavy board across the purlins because of the sore ribs complement of Jubal. Jip staggered over and helped him. When the door swung open, Hollis stood there in disbelief. Both his sons looked like they had been through a meat grinder, at least twice. He pulled his oldest son to him. What happened to you, Jip? A huge gash lay across his chin. <laughs> he, he did it, Paul. Elmer pointed to Jubal. He took a single tree to both of us. That was a lie, but Hollis swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. He raised a thumb. Get to the house and let your ma tend those wounds. Looks like I've been plumb neglectful and disappointed slick. That's about to change. The boys hurried toward the house. As Elmer looked back, he saw his pa closing the barn door. He smiled through his busted lip and bloody nose. Jubal's about to get his. Stone turned towards Hollis, who was coming at him with a single tree in one hand and a plow line in the other. Gonna teach you a lesson you won't ever forget, Jubal Stone. Now hold up, Uncle Hollis. Jubal dropped the picture in the sack with his belongings. He started to explain what had happened, but Johnson wasn't in any mood to listen. Never was, even though this was the first time that Jubal had spoken since coming to live with them. Hollis swung hard with the single tree, just missing Jubal's head. Jubal stepped to the side. Uncle Hollis, let me explain. Johnson hit him with the plow line across the face, then rushed towards him, swinging a single tree. Jubal blocked the blow as he had done with Jip and jerked a piece of wood from his uncle's grip. Then he used it to shield himself from the plow line Hollis was swinging. When the wide leather rein wrapped around the single tree, Jubal pulled at it with all his might. Hollis came down towards him off balance. He grabbed Jubal's shirt and barked profanities along with, I'm gonna kill you, slick! However, Jubal surprised his uncle with his strength and his words. With gritted teeth, he grabbed the hold of Hollis and spun him around and against the wall. The jolt knocked the wind out of Johnson and a hanging washtub off the wall into the floor. My name's Jubal, not Slick. And don't you never call me that again or raise a hand to me or I'll... Hollis's mouth flung open as he gasped for air. Surprised that Jubal could speak, but more concerned about breathing again, he waved a hand in surrender. His tone suddenly changed from a violent bully to a gentle lamb. He knew he was one wrong move away from a fist to his mouth or worse. With a long face, he made his case with palms in the air. Jubal, after all we've done for you, son, taking you into our home and treating you like one of our own, and now you're going to pay me back like this? Jubal spit in disgust. Hogwash. He turned loose of Hollis with a shove and walked over to the picture. Picking it up out of the straw, he wiped it off with his sleeve. This here's the only family I had, and now they're gone. Just as he said that, he heard a rattle. Looking up, he saw Hollis coming at him with trace chains in his hands and murder in his eyes. The end of the chain struck him across the shoulder blades, knocking him off his knees. Yet when Johnson raised the traces again, Jubal, still trying to get the cobwebs out of his head, spun around on his knees and lunged to Hollis's ankles. When Johnson fell to the ground, Jubal climbed to straddle his chest and pummeled his face with hammer fists. Hollis! Jubal! yelled Bulla as she knocked frantically on the big wooden doors. Open this door! Open this door! Jubal Stone was like a man possessed as he unleashed his fury. He did not hear Mrs. Johnson's plea. When she got no response, she hurried around to the side door, where she stepped into the hallway of the barn and screamed, Jubal, stop! Jubal! Suddenly, Stone came to his senses, snapping out of his angry trance. For almost two years, Jubal had endured ridicule and abuse at the hands of the Johnsons, particularly from Hollis, Elmer, and Jip. Bulla had attempted to shield Jubal from Hollis several times since he moved to their homestead, but her attempts were met with hostility and sometimes beatings from her husband. This evening, Jubal's anger finally found expression through his fists and his ability to speak returned. Jubal climbed off of Hollis's chest his knuckles bloody from fighting the three Johnson men, and looked at Bulla as he rose to his feet. I'll be leaving, ma'am. Obliged for your kindness. Bulla gasped. You talked. You talked, Jubal. She put her hand to his shoulder. Jubal nodded with a grin. 
Hollis lay on his back, unconscious, his face hardly recognizable. Oddly, however, Bola didn't seem overly concerned, probably because for the first time since she married him, she felt safe from his abusive hands. She leaned down and put an ear to his lips and felt his breath on her cheek. For a brief moment, she wished that Jubal had killed him. Hollis had beat her many times, but never in front of Jubal or his boys. If he wasn't backhanding her or dragging her across the room by the hair, he was battering her with disparaging words. Some of those phrases were coursing through her mind as she stood over him in the barn. You ain't worth a spit. Your own pa said you were uglier than a mud fence. I had to turn you out. Those are just a few of the many vicious things Hollis said to her over the years. Jubal grabbed up his picture and rushed to the back of the barn for the rest of his belongings. As he stuffed them in a burlap feed sack, he contemplated how he explained his actions to his aunt. Yet, he quickly realized there was no need for when he turned and walked towards Bulla. She had a raised axe in her hand and a determined look on her face. No, Aunt Bulla, don't do it. Jubal rushed toward her as she was coming down with the axe head towards Hollis's chest. Another second and she would have been a widow, a title she apparently yearned to bear. As Jubal grabbed the axe out of her hand, Bola stepped away from Hollis's body and rubbed down her apron. Brushing back her hair with the back of her hand, she looked at the door. Whew, reckon I need to get back to making supper. You two come along, it'll be ready directly. She walked out of the side door as if nothing had happened. Jubal stared at Bola until she disappeared. He was dumbfounded by her behavior and at that moment pitied her. The poor woman seemed to have lost her mind. He whispered, Goodbye, Aunt Bola. Stone swung the sack back over his shoulder and headed for the side door Bola had exited. Suddenly, he stopped and looked back at his unconscious uncle. He set down his gear, grabbed up a bucket full of water, drawn for the mules, and dumped the whole thing over Hollis's face. Wake up, Slick, he said with a slur as he dropped the wooden bucket next to his head. Hollis coughed and spit up water as he came to. Jubal wanted to make sure he had not killed him. He grinned and slung the sack back over his shoulder. Then he lit a shuck and headed for Abilene, never looking back. Jubal Stone had learned many lessons from the Johnsons. Mainly how cruel and mean people could be to one another. And the boy who that day stepped into manhood would forget none of them. Chapter 3 A Lawman to the Manor Born Jubal spent the next two months making his way towards Abilene, Texas, the town he still considered his home, even though he no longer had any kin living there. From a lot of walking to catching a ride on trains passing by, or sometimes even jumping a train, Stone was slowly but surely getting closer and closer to his destination. Along the way, he hired out to farms and homesteads, and was surprised to find that there were indeed some decent and fine people who treated him fairly. Quite a difference from his experience with the Johnsons. However, work was scarce, and usually the pay consisted of food and lodging. No money. Therefore, with no money for transportation, Jubal learned quickly how to jump trains and ride free, a practice that almost got him killed. Once he was spotted by one of the bulls, men paid by the railroad to keep the trains free for hobos and train jumpers. Usually, these fellows were mean and muscular and carried a big wooden baton, a weapon they were expert at using. Jubal had waited for the Red Eye, the train that ran after midnight, and climbed aboard it as it crawled through the sleepy little town of Rusk. He made his way to the tracks under the cover of darkness. He threw the cotton sack with his belongings over his shoulder and climbed up one of the ladders leading up into the car. Looking both ways before pulling himself aside, he was certain he got aboard undetected. Howdy, stranger, called a deep voice from the dark. Jubal's heart pounded as he quickly reached into his pocket and pulled out a match. Striking it against the wall of the car, he immediately saw the fellow who'd spoken, a skinny, old, hollow-eyed man with a stubby beard dressed in tattered rags. Howdy, mind if I run along with you? asked Jubal. Yet before the fellow could answer, a mountain of a man appeared in the doorway with a lantern in one hand and the club in the other. It was the bull. Yes, I mind you riding my train. Thought you'd haul your carcass aboard without paying, did you? 
With a scowl on his face, he set down the lantern and slapped the wooden club into his palm several times. I'm going to teach you, boy, not to ever ride one of my trains. Then he turned to the stranger who had gotten to his feet and was shaking with fear. Then I'll take care of you. Jubal took a couple of steps backwards as the bull reached down for the lantern and hung it on a nail, then moved angrily towards him. He had heard from other train jumpers of the brutality of these men who patrolled the tracks and trains, and he'd hoped he'd never come face to face with one. Yet this night he did. Stone took several strikes from the bull's big stick before he fought back. His lip was leaking blood all over his pants, and he felt like he was going to pass out. Unfortunately, the bull wasn't finished. He chuckled as he pounded the club against his palm and pursed his lips. Figured I'd give you a magic scar to go with the one on the side of your head. He pointed at the slick spot on Jubal's left temple. That proved to be a mistake. Although the man was bigger than the young stone and much more experienced in brawling, poking fun at Jubal's scar sent him into a rage. The train was moving down the tracks at high speed and into a curve. Both men widened their stance to keep their balance. The thick-chested brute made his move. He bolted towards Jubal with the raised club. Stone ducked and spun the man around. The bull was now in the entrance of the rail car when Jubal caught him with an uppercut that sent him backwards and out the door. Jubal stepped to the door and poked his head out, surprised by the outcome of the fight. He looked both ways for signs of his opponent. But all he saw was a thick black darkness that filled the Texas sky. Jubal pulled the door closed, which quickly muffled the bone-jolting sound of the train rumbling down the long steel tracks. It also gave him and his traveling partner some comfort, knowing nobody else would come through that door, at least until the train had stopped. As he slid down the iron wall to sit, the old man looked down at him. Well, friend, you give a right smart account of yourself. That there was the meanest of the train bulls, and the toughest too. He pointed towards the door. Then he looked down at the floor with a frown. He killed Ernie two weeks ago. Ernie, said Jubal as he wiped the blood from his lip with his sleeve. Yep, a good friend of mine. The man's eyes filled with tears. We rode the tracks together for over ten years. That fellow you just locked horns with cracked his head open with that big club he used on you. The old man bent down and sprawled as he joined Jubal on the floor. He pulled out a small wooden flute and blew on it a couple of times. It made a high shrill noise. Jubal winced. My name's Frank. He stuck out his hand. Jubal grinned and shook his hand. Glad to know you, Frank. My name's Jubal. He pointed toward the instrument in his hand. What's that you got there? The old man patted it against his knee and held it in the air. It's called the piccolo. Gave to me by my mom when I was about your age. Frank put it to his lips and with the movement of his fingers played the prettiest tune Jubal had ever heard. Within a few minutes, Stones' eyes became heavy and his chin sunk down to his chest. With the soothing sound resonating from the piccolo and the gentle rocking of the train going down the trails, Jubal fell into a deep sleep. A few hours later, he awoke to the screaming of the train whistle and the jolt of the locomotive as it pulled to a stop. Jubal sat up quickly and rubbed his eyes. He felt something in his shirt pocket. When he looked down, he saw the small flute of Frank's wrapped in a small piece of paper. Pulling both out, he held them to his face, then glanced towards Frank, who seemed to still be sleeping. Frank! Frank! We've got to get off the train! Frank didn't respond. Jubal reached over and grabbed his arm. Frank! Frank! When he shook him, the old man fell over on his side. He had died in the night. Jubal quickly stuffed the paper and flute in his pocket, grabbed up his sack, and got to his feet. He knew the longer he stayed on the train, the more likely another of the bulls would catch him. However, he struggled with thoughts of abandoning Frank's body. The man who played him a fine tune and left him his only earthly possessions besides the rags he was wearing and the moth-eaten blanket laying over his lap. Stone wagged his head, then tipped his hat. <sighs> Thanks for the flute, Frank. Then he slowly pulled the blanket over the old man's face and patted him affectionately on the shoulder. It had been two years since Jubal had seen his ma and pa and sister lying dead in the porch. As he looked down at Frank, those memories flooded into his mind. Again, the train whistle blew. Jubal rushed to the door and pulled it open. 
Looking both ways, he pitched his sack onto the ground and jumped. Chapter 4 A Friendly Lawman in Palestine Juba walked from the train depot into town, looking back over his shoulder several times, thinking about Frank. It was drizzling rain, so he looked for a lean-to for shelter and found one just outside the livery. He sat down, pulled his knees up under him, and buttoned up his coat to repel the water. Still thinking about Frank's death, he reached down into his pocket and pulled out the flute. Rubbing it between his fingers, he looked up and down the dark street, but it seemed like he was the only one awake in Palestine. Then he reached into his pocket for the piece of paper the instrument was wrapped in, when Frank bequeathed it to him. Reaching above his head, he struck a match against the wall he was sitting against and tried to decipher Frank's chicken scratch. Jubal of the Bible was the first man to play a flute. Play, Jubal. Play. Stone grinned and stared at the instrument in the flicker of his light, wondering if he'd ever be able to play it like Frank. His match burned down close to his finger, so he blew it out. Pushing the flute down into his jacket, he leaned his head against the wall and dozed off to sleep. Two hours later, someone kicked his boot. Wake up, son. I'm Sheriff Monty Peel. Jubal sat up straight and blinked his eyes, trying to focus on the morning light. Toby, is this the fellow you saw jump from the rail car where Frank's body was found? The tall, lanky hobo pointed. Yeah, that's him, Sheriff. That's the man who killed poor old Frank. When Jubal stood up to offer a defense, the small flute fell from beneath his pocket. Excited, Toby pointed. That there belongs to Frank. I've heard him play it a hundred times. The skinny fellow grabbed Jubal by the coat. Why'd you kill him, young feller? Why'd you do Frank in? Jubal quickly pushed him away and pulled out the piece of paper Frank had given him. Sheriff Peel, this paper. He held it in the air. And that flute yonder, he pointed to the ground where it lays was given to me by Frank. Jubal shrugged his shoulders. Sometime during the night, the old fellow must have known he was dying. When I woke up, I found the paper and flute in my pocket, and Frank dead. Arrest him, Sheriff, demanded Toby. He's guilty. Peel threw up a hand. All right, Toby, I'll handle it from here. Off in the distance, a train whistle blew. Sounds like the iron horse is about to pull out. Best get or you'll miss your ride. Toby nodded and went for the flute. Figure I'll take this with me. But Jubal was quick as a cat and put his boot down on top of it. Frank left that to me. I figure it's mine. Both men looked at the sheriff for the decision. I reckon he's right, Toby. According to that paper, Frank left it to him. Toby wagged his head and stomped off towards the train depot. Sheriff Peel chuckled. <laughs> You'd think by the way Toby acted that he and Frank were parts. They weren't? asked Jubal as he looked at the sheriff curiously. Nah, Tony's a scavenger. He stole from Frank and the others riding the rails. Frank told me so. How did you know Frank? asked Jubal. The old fellow came by Palestine a couple times a week. Sometimes he'd drop by the office for a cup of coffee. He was quite a character, Monty chuckled. I'll tell you something else. He pointed towards the flute. He thought a lot about that piece of wood yonder. <laughs> Seems that Toby liked it too. Peel spat. Shoot, reckon if he gripped that flute, he would have traded up the tracks before the rooster crowed. Jubal stepped over and picked up the flute, wiping the dirt off it. He smiled. Maybe one day I'll learn to play it. What's your last name, son? Sheriff Peel asked as he bit off one of the corners of his tobacco plug and looked up the street as if looking for an outlaw. The town was now coming to life. A man carrying two milk cans walked by and said hello to Monty. More will. You could hear voices and people walking up the boardwalks. Stone. My last name's Stone. Monty was just about to spit his quid but stopped and spun on his heels. He spat and wiped his chin. He pointed. Your pa, Joe Stone, the ranger and sheriff. Yes, sir, he was. Peel rubbed his chin and grinned. Well, I thought you favored somebody else I knew. I just couldn't recollect until you said your last name was Stone. Me and your pa were good friends. He was the best lawman in Texas. Jubal's face turned red. His fury burned. Pa came out of the house. 
They shot him down like a dog. Him, Ma, and my sister. Monty reached and patted Jubal on the shoulder. I was plumb sorry to hear that news. Let's you and me go wrap our mouth around some biscuits and bacon. What do you say, Jubal? So you're not going to arrest me for Frank's death? Sheriff Peel waved his hand. Nah. Frank had a bad heart. Told me so himself. He knew his days were numbered. I tried to get him to stay in Palestine, but riding them rails was home to him. Jubal sighed in relief. <sighs> Biscuits and bacon sound good, Sheriff, but I ain't got no money. I'd be glad to work for my breakfast, maybe split some wood or whatever you need done. Peel was already taking a shine to Jubal. In just a few short minutes, he'd known the young stone. He saw a law of Joe in him. A man beholden to nobody, and from his swollen lip and bruised cheek, a fighter to the manner born. Pointing up the street, Monty started walking towards Rosie's diner. We'll talk about that over cat heads and coffee. Jubal grabbed up his sack and grinned. Sounds good to me, Sheriff. He hurried to catch up with Peel, who was walking briskly towards the restaurant. As the men got seated, a tall, slender redhead came sashaying across the room to take their order. She looked about half asleep. What do you have, Sheriff? The usual? Peel nodded. I believe I will, Rosie. He pointed a thumb at Jubal. Bring this fella here all the biscuits and bacon he can eat. Jubal grinned. <laughs> Obliged, Sheriff. Like I said, I'll work it off. Coffee, Sheriff? Monty slapped the table. At least a full pot, Rosie. Rosie smiled and looked down at the Jubal. Her face wrinkled as she leaned over closer to his face. My, that lip looks bad. You best get him up to Doc's. Rosie stared over to Peel. Jubal shifted in his chair uncomfortably with Rosie's attention. Monty waved a hand. Nah, stop mothering, Rosie. With a wide grin, he continued. What he needs right now is some vittles in his crawl. Think we get our breakfast before lunch? Rosie didn't appreciate Peel's humor. She turned and walked towards the kitchen, but not before tossing him a stern frown. Jubal wagged his head incredulously. <laughs> Looks like I got Rosie's goat, huh, Jubal? Yes, sir, but I'm wondering what she's cooking up for us back yonder. He looked over his shoulder towards the kitchen, then back to Peel. No sooner had he turned around that Rosie came through the swinging door with a pot of coffee, two cups, and a plate of biscuits with a side of bacon. Here's your breakfast, with cut in the eyes. She pointed across the table. As for you, your lunch will be out shortly. Monty winked. Rosie reciprocated with a smile, a warm smile, one that Jubal was oblivious to as the sight and smell of hot biscuits and fried bacon captivated his senses. The moment the food reached the table, Jubal grabbed up a biscuit and pulled it apart. Then he folded up two pieces of bacon and made a sandwich. Three bites later, both biscuit and bacon disappeared. Given the cat heads were about the size of a big man's fist, that was quite the feat. Monty chuckled, removed his hat, and laid it on the seat of one of the empty chairs. Bowing his head, he said grace. When finished, Jubal swallowed big and looked across the table sheepishly. <laughs> Sorry, Sheriff. Reckon I got ahead of myself. My ma taught me better than that. Peel pursed his lips, nodded, then clasped his hands and put them on the table. It's alright, Jubal. I figured the good lord understands when a man's really hungry. Monty took a gulp of his coffee, swallowed, then cocked his head sideways. Looks to me like you and Stanley got acquainted. Jubal stopped chewing and stared curiously across the table. Stanley? Yep, that mongrel the railroad hired to punish those riding free, one of their bulls. He works this section of tracks from Nacogdoches all the way to Waco. Monty pointed east then west. With gritted teeth, he continued. He's killed many a hobo. Gave Frank a few beatings. Jubal poured some molasses onto his plate and mixed some butter with it. Sopping his biscuit into the mix, he looked up and nodded in agreement. Frank told me that the bull did Ernie in. Frank's pardon. And that's a fact. I hope to meet up with Stanley again soon. He balled up his fist. Got something I want to give him. Jubal smiled widely. A little bit of breakfast spilled out of his mouth. He grabbed up the cloth on the table and wiped his mouth. 
Rosie came up behind him with a platter full of food. Monty's lunch, as she called it. Peel picked up the fork and knife laying atop the small piece of cloth and looked with excitement towards the platter Rosie was holding. As she placed the food down on the table, Jewel marveled at the size of breakfast the sheriff was having. Monty felt his stare. I eat once a day. Rosie overheard his words. <laughs> yeah, it starts in the morning, eats all day. Jubal laughed, but quickly grimaced in pain. His swollen lip reminded him of his scuffle with Stanley. Rosie topped off their cups with hot coffee and said she'd be back directly. She walked across the room to see two men coming through the door. Monty stared at them for a few seconds, studying them up and down before forking his eggs. Jubal picked up his concern and looked over his shoulder. Anybody you know? Peel shook his head. Nah, that's not what worries me. Strangers always put me on edge. He picked up his knife and carved out a piece of the salted ham. As he chewed, he pointed the knife at Jubal. How'd you get out of that rail car alive? Stanley prides himself on hobbling a man where he can't board another train. Jubal looked down at his hand and made a fist. You remember what you wanted to give, Stanley? Monty grinned and nodded. Well, I ain't give him one of mine. Last I saw of him, he was falling backwards out of the door. Monty slapped the table with excitement. <laughs> Son, you reminded me more and more of Joe Stone. The iron in his fist was as deadly as the iron he toted on his side. I've seen him take many a man down to size with his bare knuckles. Jubal leaned into Monty. He was as hungry to hear about his paw as he was for the biscuits and bacon. Peel started to tell another tale about Joe, when suddenly one of the strangers across the room caught his gaze. He saw him reach down and unlatch the leather atop his pistol hammer, a small detail any good lawman would notice if he wanted to stay alive in the frontier. Monty kept his eyes on the stranger as he reached and tapped the table in front of Jubal's plate. Grab your cup and go to the kitchen door and ask Rosie for some more coffee. Jubal didn't flinch in responding. He knew from the sheriff's demeanor something serious was about to happen. Monty rose from his seat and stepped to the side of the table, wiping his mouth with the cloth and dropping it to his chair. He widened his stance and lowered his hand above his gun. Peering across the room, he asked in a loud, booming voice, You got business with me, stranger? The four other customers in the diner rushed towards the door, two women and two men. One of the women let out a scream as she exited. I do, if you're the law dog in this town. That'd be me, Sheriff Monty Peel. Rosie came out of the kitchen with a pot of coffee in her hand. Jubal waved the hand and stepped in front of her. Best wait right here, ma'am. She gasped and then whispered. Not again. Jubal wasn't sure what she meant, but now was not the time to ask for clarification. Both of them watched with great anticipation. Then the second man stood and pushed his chair back into the table. Jubal whispered to Rosie, If only I had a gun. Just as he spoke those words, he felt something poke him in the back. It was a shotgun, and sticking it through the kitchen door was a small spindly fellow named Pedro, the cook and half-owner of the establishment. Rosie saw Jubal flinch, then noticed a barrel of the gun poking out from the door. She leaned towards him. Take Pedro's gun! Jubal reached around and took the shotgun with his right hand. One of the gunmen noticed movement next to the kitchen and pointed. Hey, you two over there, sit down. This won't take but a minute, both gunmen chuckled. Rosie took a step towards the chairs. Jubal jumped in front of her, pointing the shotgun at the strangers. Get back into the kitchen, Miss Rosie. Me and the sheriff have some business to tend to. Jubal's grit made Peel smile. He gestured with his head. Boys, that there is Joe Stone's son, Jubal. Some trash like you that killed his pa. Heck, it might have been you two. There continued to be a bounty on Texas lawmen across the state. Highbinders and outlaws promised those who killed any man wearing a thousand dollar reward. Nervously, the men glanced at each other. Then the biggest one made a bad mistake. He smirked. You talk about that law dog of Abilene and his pretty wife and little girl? He turned to his partner for his response. But when he turned back around, Jubal had the shotgun inches from his head. A shot rang out. It was a sheriff's colt barking from across the room. The big man's partner drew on Jubal, which proved to be fatal. Monty held his pistol on the second man, yet there was really no need. 
The short, double-barreled shotgun Jubal was holding was now pressed against the man's forehead. Take his gun, Jubal. Jubal reached across to his holster. The stranger grabbed at the shotgun. Stone seemed to know what he was going to do and knead him in the stomach and slammed the butt of the gun against his chin. The big fellow fell backward onto a table which collapsed to the floor, splintering into multiple pieces. Jubal stood a straddle of him. Were you in on the killing of my family? Stone asked in a calm, eerie tone, but the man didn't answer. He eased the hammer forward on the shotgun and pitched it to the sheriff, who was now just a few feet away. Then he reached down and grabbed the stranger by the collar, pulling him in within an inch of his face. I'm going to ask you one more time. Were you in on murdering my family? Jubal shook him several more times. The gunman didn't seem rattled at all. Go pound sound down a gopher hole. What happened next is hard to explain. The 16-year-old pulled the big man off the floor to his feet in one fell swoop. The big guy took a swing at Jubal, just like Stanley had done the night before. Stone ducked and spun him around. Catching him with an uppercut to his chin, the chin that was already bleeding compliments of the shotgun butt. The man grabbed Jubal by the shirt, but Stone Fists pounded his midsection with such force and rapidity that he was forced to let him go. Jubal kicked his legs out from under him and straddled his chest. Blow after blow, he hammered the man with his fists until his body went limp. That didn't stop Jubal. He hit him several more times before he felt the firm hand on his shoulder. That's enough, Jubal. Jubal, that's enough! Peel's words finally got through Jubal. Out of breath and with a blood-soaked shirt, skin knuckles, and haggard look, peered up at the sheriff with searching eyes, then crawled off the stranger and fell to the floor, exhausted. Rosie rushed over with a cup of water and a basin of water and cloth. She whispered, I ain't never seen anything like that, Monty. That boy was fighting like he wasn't even human. Peel looked down at Jubal. That's what a couple of years of pent-up anger will do. He leaned into Rosie. He saw his pa, ma, and little sister gunned down on their porch. He bent down. Let's get him in a chair. When they did, Rosie held a cup of water to Jubal's lips. Drink this, Jubal. Barely conscious, Stone took the cup and mumbled. Thank you, ma'am. As he put it to his lips. Rosie then took the cloth and dipped it in the basin and wrung the water out of it. Let's get you cleaned up. You go out of there looking like that, folks will be scared to eat here. The three of them chuckled. Pedro rushed out with the mop and a bucket of water, speaking in Spanish. He quickly flipped the chairs upside down and put them on the tables. Then he quickly picked up what was left of the busted table, splinters, and kindling mostly, and took them by the fireplace. Pointing at the dead man, he asked the sheriff if he would send the undertaker over as soon as possible to remove the body. When Rosie finished cleaning Jubal's facial cuts, Peel grabbed out the basin of bloody water and threw it on the big man lying on the floor. Pedro's temper flared. He barked something in Spanish at the sheriff, grabbing up his mop and went to cleaning the floor. Rosie frowned. Now you've got him mad. Jubal looked down at the floor, disturbed by what he saw. Somewhat guilty, he wagged his head in remorse. D did I do that? You sure did, Jubal. Wasn't sure there for a moment if you were going to stop. Jubal put his face in his hands. Monty looked up at Rosie and shrugged his shoulders, wondering what he would say. Her womanly instincts kicked in, and she knelt down beside Stone, gently touching his hands. She pulled up his chin and leaned down. Jubal. You're a fine young man, and I know what you did to that fellow bothers you. She looked over at Monty. Fact is, you saved us from having to find another sheriff. It would take us a long time to find an ornery cuss like Monty. Peel frowned, but his frown quickly turned to a smile. Jubal, you remember saying you'd work off your breakfast? Yes, sir. Well, your bill is paid in full. Now, if Rosie is through mothering you, I'd like to offer you a job. A job? asked Jubal curiously. I need a good deputy, a man who can handle himself. Peel looked down at the big man on the floor who was now trying to figure out what had happened to him. For what I've seen here today, looks like Jubal Stone fits the bill. What do you say? Peel reached across the table to shake on it. Jubal smiled through his busted lip and gripped his hand. I'd like that, Sheriff Peel. I'd like that just fine.
Thank you for listening to this episode of Stagecoach, brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, the home of Western excellence where the best of the Western authors can be found. Visit our website at dspublishingnetwork.com. Please join us for our next episode as we continue with the adventures of Jubal Stone, U.S. Marshal, Blood Trail to Hell by Casey Nash.